I brought you food. It's Dr. No. Becker. <laughs> I don't want to walk through your house though. I'm covered in mud. Can I just set everything here? I always use diabetes as the most obvious example of what food insecurity impacts on a health scale. And that's because it's the easiest to measure. You know, it's really easy for me to say, what are your blood sugars for the last week? And it's, I can pull up their hemoglobin A1C and graph it over the last five years. But what I can't measure in as reliable a way is the emotional impact that that has on people because um, they don't want to be honest about it. You know, we do depression screening. I can tell you the PHQ-9 score on every patient that's walked in this building in the last six months because we've done a depression screen every time someone's been here. So I can give you a number for that, but it's just not the same as sticking someone's finger and saying your blood sugar is 200. It's different because they, they have to be comfortable enough to say, I don't have enough money to go to the grocery store. They don't want to say that because they, one, then don't want to, they don't want to get all upset. They're here because they're here because they need their medicines refilled and they want to get back to work. And that opens up this whole nother almost therapy session. Or they think, why would I tell them all that when they can't do anything about it? Recently, um, we had one grocery store in Aaron County and it has since closed. So it, it presents a lot of challenge for our students. Uh, parents to get full groceries and things, it's almost a hour drive. Uh, one way to get to a grocery store and you know kids have been impacted by that because you can't just go down there and pick something up for a dinner or small snack or something that you're out of when kids come to school um, and they you know they don't have snacks or they're worried about things like that it's hard to focus on the academics and doing the things that will make you successful it's been really difficult What we think happened, and, and Dr. Becker spoke with the owners of the grocery store. I mean, she physically went to them and, and asked them to try to find a way to stay open out of concern for her patients and the citizens who live in that community. And the grocery store owners, you know, really expressed a couple of different reasons why they couldn't stay in business. And one was the cost of doing business in Clay, and that as the only grocery store, they were challenged with deliveries and people that would participate in their business. So this is actually the second time we've had a grocery store closed since I've been a family doctor here in Clay. And so that's part of why there's this huge need for other ways to access food for these mobile food pantries that Mountaineer Food Bank does. I mean, their people depend on them because they don't have a way to get all the way to Flatwoods or all the way to Charleston. A lot of times if somebody has to pay someone to take them to the store, you know, that's a significant part of their food budget. And so people are having to sacrifice, you know, one thing for another to be able to get access to produce. They can get all the frozen pizza and boxed pastas that they want at the dollar store and fried chicken from GoMart, but they can't get a salad. Or if they do, they'll say, you know, I eat really well for about a week after I go to the store. And then that quality just goes down each week from then until they can get back to a store because stuff just doesn't last that long. When you go shopping here, it's an all day, you know, half day at least, because it's in a lot of places, it's an hour drive. And when I go, I go to the grocery store, or the dollar store, or the pharmacy, it's do everything one day. And I buy groceries basically for the whole month. I'd love to, you know, be able to run to a, a close grocery store and buy like grapes or strawberries or, and keep them just peaceful. But, you can't if you, you know, you can't buy up in bulk the fruit and expect it not to go to waste. So um, usually when we're talking about food insecurity, we're talking about access to enough food for a healthy lifestyle. So there are lots of things that contribute to food insecurity. The most common predictor is poverty itself. So oftentimes with, um, with those who are hungry, there are often people who are on fixed incomes. So there's not a lot of opportunity to have more income in the household. So it's a, it's a situation that can, can also persist over a long period of time. 
I think one of the other things when we think about food insecurity um, are the trade-offs that families have to make. And so if you think about people making decisions about healthcare, and it might be someone's medication in your family versus feeding the other three people in your family. And no one wants to make any of those decisions. Like that's just really stressful um, and adds to those layers um, of, of the experience of food insecurity. When something's not going well for somebody, you kind of have to like, number one, you have to have a relationship with them. And two, you have to be willing to ask those questions, not just be like, oh, oh, you don't have a ride. Oh, you didn't go to that heart doctor appointment because you didn't have a ride. Oh, you, you eat pinto beans every day and that's all you eat. You've eaten raisins every day for two weeks and that's all. It takes asking like, why are you only eating raisins? Why well, didn't have a ride to the store? Well, why don't you have a ride to the store? Who used to take you to the store? Who's going to take you to the store next time? It takes asking those whys, which consumes a big part of my visit with people, but otherwise I'm just saying, oh, your sugar's bad and you gained weight. Your blood pressure's high still. But like, if you dig, you can figure out why those things are happening and then you can try to find ways to fix them. What are some things that the community has done to try and compensate for not having that grocery store? Well, so there's a few things, um, and it's not as consistent as we would like it to be, but it's better than nothing. So the United Way and Dr. Becker's office have partnered with Mountaineer Food Bank, which is one of our largest food distributors here in the state. And so at first we were going every two weeks, which wasn't terrible. They were at least getting some pretty good um, non-perishable and fresh perishable foods twice a month. Um, but since the pandemic, that has gone to once a month. So, I mean, we might serve as many as a thousand people once a month, um, which is about an eighth of the population of the county. And what I think what everybody thought is eventually somebody would come back and open a store, right? If, if it's long enough without there being one, somebody would see a need. Um, and we just haven't seen anybody have any interest in going back. Some things that we do to help our uh, students that are struggling. We have a food pantry that we have here at the school that we've tried to provide it, that we try to give families on Friday, get some food out to them to do them through the weekend, help them out. This is where we keep our, okay. our food things like that. And like I said, normally kids come in and organize and they'll like see things dated. They get they out they do the bags. They'll put the bags. And then that way when we come in here on Friday, kids come up, we just put them in there and we See anybody that knows anybody that needs any food, they'll, they'll come in, the door will be here and you just hand them a bag and they go. So one of the things when we talk about food insecurity, of course you get into like, well, how are we going to improve uh, food insecurity? How can we help support families? And I often say that the it's not really about food. <laughs> um, and, and we think about sort of your, your basic needs. We think about housing and food and safety and water access, all of these issues are apparent in Appalachia. And we know that if you have high utility bills, you're going to have less to spend on other, um, other household budget items. And so ASP being able to come in and actually make a difference in the, the house can, can make a great impact on those utility bills themselves. Housing First is a concept that addresses the shelter needs of a person first and foremost before addressing additional needs like food or education, addiction relief, various different things like that. So for ASP we see that a nice warm safe dry place to live is vital as a foundation for continuing on to progress on other successful areas in your life. I just want us to remember that in all of the, the counties um, that we work in with ASP, there are a lot of great um, small and large institutions and organizations and people that are working to feed their community and kind of attack the issue from different uh, angles. You know, like my friends that live in other states or whatever, there's always this like, why do people still live there? Why don't they go somewhere else? Why don't they just move to where there's a grocery store? Well, because they're proud of where they live. They're proud of their home. They're proud of their land. They know everybody around them. This is where they want to be. And they're not moving just because there's no grocery store. Like, they want to be here. They just want to have produce. Like, how hard is that to make happen in 2021? Like, the, the lady that I took the stuff all the way into the kitchen, like, she kind of cried when, she, when I took the lid off the produce box. I said, this is what I knew you wanted. So, and then she hugged me and I said, thank goodness we've all been vaccinated here. <laughs>